This is the story of a man and a woman who lived in a beautiful garden. It's a story of a snake who tricked mankind for thousands of years. It's a story of God and his promises. It's the story of one who's coming back to crush the head of the snake. And to give us that home we once had, we might have forgotten. All right, so Rodney said it earlier, we're going to talk about God's better story uh, for finances. And there's always this collective oh, finance, money. We're going to talk about money, but it is true. It's not what I want for, from you. It's what God wants for us all. And so this, I'm telling you, this message, if you apply what I'm going to teach today, no, what Jesus tells us, it will change your life. We've been talking about anxieties and worries and the, the world story up against God's better story. And we've said the world story, man, it's creating a lot of tension, anxiety in our hearts, worry. And there may be no other area in our lives than, than finances that brings more of that. We have this generalized anxiety, many of us, and worry in our lives because we're focused on stuff, money, finances, what the Bible calls mammon. It's all that. Okay. Many years ago, Stacy and I were, um, gosh, just not newly married. We, our kids were born, at least the girls. And uh, so we had little ones at home, and we had gone on a vacation. We we're living in Lake Highlands, and, and we headed over to North Carolina for a vacation. We were there, and our sweet vacation time with family got interrupted by our sweet neighbor who called us and said, hey, your house has been broken into. I was like, ugh. So I got him on the phone. We walked around and said, okay, go in here. Okay, go in this room. Tell me, is this, open that drawer. Is it there? Is, is that, no, gone. Ah, oh, okay, go over here. Stace got some, some jewelry over here in this drawer. It's like this one down. Okay, open that drawer. Gone. I was like, oh man, go in. Okay, okay, go down the hall. Okay, turn, go in this other room now. Computer. Gone. Okay, uh, we, let's see, we got a little, we got some crystal, we got some stuff that came from our wedding, we, we got some, gone. Everything of any value, and we didn't have much, but everything of value was gone. Anybody ever had anything like that happen to you? Anybody? We had a car stolen one time. I mean, this sense of violation, right, was just maddening. And, and it, you know, it caused us then, you kind of live in this, Yikes! We've got. We need a better security system. We need to lock everything up. We be, we've got to hide things out. We've got to. You know, it raises this sense of, oh my gosh. Do you ever do you ever feel anxious, worried about securing your finances, securing your stuff? You ever been through that? I mean, we all do, right? And today I want to talk about, again, God's better story for your finances. So I want you to grab your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6, all right? We're going to bust through uh, this passage of Scripture, verses 19 through 24. Matthew 6, verse 19 through 24. And the question I want to ask is, what steps can we take, what steps can I take to live out God's better story for my finances? Now, there's a couple of twists that you're going to discover along the way, so hang with me. And I want every young person in here... Every person, whatever age you are, I want you to listen because this message will change your life. I'm telling you, this message will impact your life for the rest of your life. God's better story for your finances. All right. So how can I guard my finances first? And you're going to just hang with me. There's some twist here. First, number one, lock your safe. All right. Lock your safe. Look at what it says here. Verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, in the ancient world, we'll pause there for a sec to put this in context. Um, banks were in, in their infancy. Uh, it, so finances really were wrapped up in, like, say, jewelry, jewels, or maybe in fabrics and some, something that you owned. It was wrapped up in what you had. But what they would do, they would literally hide away, often underground, in the home. You'd have a place, probably in a chest. You'd put it underground and hide it away. 
where no one could get to it. All right. So see, ultimately, earthly wealth, we all know this is true today, is subject to entropy, right? It's subject to decay. Inflation uh, undermines kind of the value of money. Cars depreciate, right? Um, uh, Real estate rises or falls. Stocks end up unreliable. Companies come and go, right? Think Blockbuster, you know, once. Kids are like, what? Eh, never mind. Um, that we used to put these things in a in a thing. I mean, it was a we'd go rent movies. I mean, it's a crazy stuff was happening back then. Um, but 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 with the whole company's gone, right? And so so some so here's here's the deal. Watch this. Jesus offers an alternative financial security plan. Look at this. Look at verse twenty. But lay but lay up yourselves. Treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust dis, uh, destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice Jesus doesn't say don't lay up treasures. You catch that? He says do lay up, lay up treasures, but make sure they're in the right place, not where they devalue, deflate, depreciate. He's saying lay up treasures in heaven. Now, what is he talking about here? We thought he's talking about money. Watch this. Bam! He's talking about worship. He's talking about your heart. You know where this goes, if you know this passage. The heavenly economy is not based on hard work, earning rewards. It's not trying to hide out things, protect all things. All things in heaven are secured forever by God. Here's what I mean. Lock up your safe. Lock your heart in a right relationship with God Everything else will follow. This is where he's heading, right? Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be added unto you. Now, the question becomes, why does Jesus offer an alternative? Why is he concerned or care about our money? The reason Jesus cares about our money, why he talked more about money than heaven, by the way, is because of the way our hearts work. Our hearts get attached to certain things. And then he says this. This is so profound. Most profound statement in all of scripture, I believe, regarding worship. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We attach our hearts to things, right? We all do this. We've done it since we were kids. Stuffed animals. Uh, favorite toy. Right? Okay. Um, you know, a car. We get old. We just trade our toys. Our home. Our job. Uh, the approval of others. I mean, they can be all kinds of things that our hearts are attached to. And Jesus is saying, whatever your heart is attached to, wherever that goes, wherever, whatever you value the most is where your heart runs. And I want you to think with me deeply. I've taught on this before, but I want you to think. Here's what Jesus is saying. The object of your desire, the object of your hope, whatever you place your trust in is what you worship, and that's where your entire life will go. All of your energy, you say, well, how do I know? I'm going to ask some, some diagnostic questions along the way. Whatever you value the most in life, and it could be multiple things, but whatever you value, your mind, your energy, your actions are going to run that way. And again, they don't have to be tangible things. I, I, I like to say it this way. I'm a husband. I mean, there's a lot of storylines in my life, like yours. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a friend. I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a pastor. I'm all of those things. But none of those things are the truest thing about me. Because any one of those things that I just mentioned could be taken away from me today. I got a text from my sweet mom this morning. My mom, my dad passed away some years ago. My mom is 86 years old, teaching her little group of Sunday school class this morning. I mean, in great health, praise be to God. Uh, someday, I'm not going to get text anymore. I will cease to be a son, at least with parents on the planet. Someday, frankly, I'm not going to be a pastor anymore. And here's the deal. If I find my identity, my worth in something other than you say, well, Jeff, who are you? Watch this. I'm a beloved son of God. That's who I am. That is not going to be taken away from me. It's the one thing, in fact, that will not be taken away along with everything else that goes with the kingdom. And so Jesus says it's the object of your faith. It's why C.S. Lewis put it this way. Don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose. How crazy is that, right? 
Why would you place all your trust, all of your energies, your heart's desire, your passion, your schedule, the stuff that you worry about, anxious about? Why would you place it in something that's going to be taken away? Who does this? All of us. And you're here today because God wants to remind you through the words of his son, Jesus, this is not the way to live. We talk about it this way. It, this is whatever is an idol in your life. It's a God, little g. Jesus says, don't do it. And this has been so helpful for me. How would I know? How would I know if, if, if I, I place my trust in things other than God? Because it's not as easy to discern. Because all of us here, on, on our best moment in worship, on a Sunday, we're singing to God, who do you live for? Who are you living for? Where are you placing your trust? What are you placing your trust in? Most of us say, well, God, I think. God. Okay, watch this. Your deepest emotions, fear, anxiety, anger, will point you to your God, will point you to your idol. Watch this. There's only one first. So this disordered love, this idolatry is not easily discerned. So psychologist uh, Alfred Adler, hang with me here. I, I kind of he didn't quite say it this way, but it really helped me understand this. A kind of mashup of spirituality and psychology a bit to help me understand this. He noted that it's so hard to figure out what you're really living for. You can't just ask yourself, what am I living for? And answer the question. You're not that self-aware. And I would argue that sin has made us so we can't even see this stuff. Instead, Adler says this. He said, look at your nightmare. Look at your nightmare. Here's what he means. What thing, if absent, would almost or would take away your reasons to live? What thing, that, if it were taken away, it, that defines you, you would struggle to even make it in this life? In other words, what do you fear losing? And again, it could be, you could say, well, my kids, my spouse, spouse it can become an idol. Marriage has become an idol for some. And even for singles who are pursuing marriage, become an idol. When, when instead we're going to only find our worth, our identity in God and him alone. And so it could be your reputation, could be uh, your position, could be the approval of others, could be your stuff. What is your thing? Could be a ministry that you are finding all of your identity and worth. We must discern, listen, expose these idols and destroy them. In fact, I've learned this in my own life because I'm not so prone to just give away all my stuff and those things that I run to apart from God. I believe that discipleship, literally, I, I've, I've come to believe this, is real sanctification, okay, becoming more and more like Christ, is God stripping away my idols one at a time. And that is an ugly and difficult process of grief to walk through, but it's for our own good. So here's what Paul says in Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality. These are all these things. Impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, greed is what that is, which is idolatry. So we must place our hearts in the only secure place they belong, in a right relationship with God. You've got to lock your heart up with God and find security in Christ alone. This is the beginning of your... Say, Jeff, I thought you were talking about finances. Okay, hang with me. Look at number two. Turn on the lights. How do you secure your stuff? Lock it up. Lock up your heart. Turn on the lights. Look at what Jesus says. If you want to secure eternal treasure, you must turn on the lights. Because light exposes the darkness. We know this, right? You want to play secure, you turn on the light. And so look at verse 22. This is what he's saying. The, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Now, he's referring to a cultural metaphor that we don't use often, but we understand it. We would say that you, you, you've heard the eyes are the window of the soul. You know, um, th This is what Jesus is saying. He says the, the heart, the eye is like a heart. It, it's a lamp that reveals the quality of a person's inward life. And there's some debate as to, what, is he talking about light coming in or light going out? And I've kind of landed on both. If you're focused on God, 
then the light that comes into your life is the light of his truth. It's love in and it's love out. You become more and more generous when you realize what Christ has done for you. And so your heart is locked up in your salvation, the fact that you're defined by him and nothing else. And now you're able to see. But you've got to keep the light on if you're going to secure your finances, if you will, your heart in the right place. Now, I want to offer this as an example for you. As a church family, we're, gonna, we're sharing this across the board. Over the last 10 years, our giving here in our church, I just want to celebrate with you for a moment. We are in, if you're a guest, we're a generous church. Um, we, we want to be an example for you personally. But over the past 10 years, our giving has increased $1.4 million. And this past year, we had the, we had the third, third uh, largest, highest giving year ever in the life of our church. And you add the Give Up to Give translation project. Many of you gave to $300,000 nearly I think, that we raised. Um, we had the second highest of all time in the life of our church. And it was only second to this 2012-13 anomaly, which was a tax kind of change that year. But the average gift, this is interesting, the average gift to the church over a year, in the course of a year, is $6,472. That's up $625 since just a few years ago, 2016. Adversely, the number of people who are giving to, in our church has declined since two, 2016, over the past three years. But this is interesting. Listen to this. I find this interesting. 28% of our budget funding comes from people 65 or older. And a lot of us, you know, it's like, well, yeah, those men are old people. They, they give. I mean, they're big time givers, right? They do this. Watch this. 28%, same, same percentage of 50 to 65 year olds give 28% of our budget. And then watch this right behind 22%. 22% comes from ages 35 to 50. We have a strong and diverse, yes, shout out, um, to uh, giving collective in our church. That, my point is, and watch this, our young adults, 25 and younger, give over a million dollars to our budget. Right? I mean, that's worth celebrating. We're praising God for that. I'm saying this because some of us, many of us are no, a lot of us are generous. And I praise God for you. You're not giving to me. I'm just praising God for what we're able to do then through all of your giving. And by the way, we and I mean, when you think about that group, the youngest group, consider they're just in the workforce. They have student loans coming out the wazoo. Did I say that in a sermon? It's like $1.2 trillion of student loans are out there these days. And there's still, this group is saying, no, 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 I'm going to give to the Lord. And here's the thing. We give away $1.7 million of, uh, to mission partners. 13% of our budget is given away to specific partners away from ourselves. Say, this is, this is for the kingdom of God and the gospel advancement around the world. And God honors that is my point. It's not this, you know, it's, it's not like if we give, he's going to bless us. It's not this prosperity gospel thing. If your heart is right, he's going to bless your life. And again, we often run to, yeah, we're like more money. You mean like he's going to, if I give, he's going to, no, no, no. More than that, better than that. But when you set your heart on him, as we seek to do as a church collectively, we are able to give and bless others. And now the last thing I want you to see, thirdly, Turn on the alarm, all right? Lock up your heart, turn on the lights, let his truth guide you, turn on the alarm. Now, here's another twist. We thought he was talking about finances. Now the storyline changes. We, he, he was actually, he's talking about worship. And now, look at this. I want you to see what money reveals where the heart is. It reveals what we worship. That's why he's talking about money. And so he says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate, this sounds like a non sequitur as well, he, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't serve God and mammon. Somebody said, I know that money can't buy happiness, but I'd love to be able to prove that personally. Right? You cannot pursue God and money at the same time. Again, now, how would we know we're doing this? Because real quick, we're like, Jeff, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not worshiping money. I worship God. Or you might be thinking like me. You're going, man, Jeff, real talk. I, I have a lot of masters in my life. I mean, think about your life. All these diversions, my spouse, my kids, my bills, my work, 
My, my, all of these things are coming at us. And Jesus is not saying, you know, I'm trying to serve my kids. And yeah, they're a distraction, but I'm, he's not. No, no, no. What he's saying here, he uses the word uh, duleo. It's from the word doulos, which means slave. If you're worshiping money, you become a slave to it. And if you are, as we're going to see here, like he says in Proverbs 22, 7, the borrower is, anybody know? Slave to the lender. If you have, have so much debt in your life, you can't be set free to, you, you don't think you can be, because you, you, can't, you can't give like you want to be. You can't be generous like you want to be because you're a slave. Because you, you have all of this debt and this Financial Peace University, by the way, that Rodney mentioned earlier, that course will change your life. The first phase is to get out of debt. And I'm telling you, you need to be a part of that. Check it out. It's in the bulletin. September uh, 11th, I believe, is when that starts. Is that right? You can see it there. God gets, gets, uh, gets the glory when we turn to him. But here's what he's saying. Here's what happens. If you serve money and possessions, that's where your heart is. That's where your mind runs. That's where you think about. That's what you work on all the time, making more money. God gets in the way. That's what he's saying. And even today, there's tension. The tension's real. You're like, oh, Jeff, man, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I pray that it's the Holy Spirit that's at work convicting you. We must decide to seek him first or we'll end up hating him. Jesus used this language elsewhere. Hate up against love. We hate him by ignoring his commands. We hate him when the pastor talking about money. We hate him because we're not prioritizing him and not serving him with our lives. It's this contrast. But here's the irony of the story. You know, in our homes, our apartments, our, our businesses, in museums, we have these sophisticated alarm systems. But here's what I want you to see. Here's what I believe Jesus is saying. In the economy of God, in his kingdom, money is the alarm. Money is the alarm. Money is what goes off, and it should point us. Here's a specific test. Watch this. Here's the test. It's this simple. How do I know if money has captured my heart and it's become an idol in my life? How do I know? There's one way. There's many ways, but there's one key way. Are you a giver? Are you a giver? If not, it's captured your heart. Are you holding on loosely to the stuff of God? Look at what it says in 1 John 3.16. You know John 3.16. Watch this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Let's get practical. John Wesley said this. I'm going to get really practical here. John Wesley said, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I like that. Now, I don't know about, I'm not as awesome as John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, but I'd add, I'd add a little something. He's got three things. I want, to talk to, I want to talk to you about five things you can do with your money. And y'all, this is going to change your life. I'm a financial expert. A lot of you don't know this. But five things. It's just biblical stuff. Five things you can do with your money. The world's way is, is sure enough that. Make all you can. Forget the other part. Make all you can. That's the first step. Make all you can. Make all you can. Jesus says, watch out. Be on guard. In Luke 12, 15, he says, because you be guard against all grief, he said. I mean, greed, he says. Because one's life is not found in abundance of possessions. It's not where it is. And so here's what the world does, all right? I want you to see something here. The world story is this. First, you spend it. That's the first thing you do. Make money. Don't you make money to spend? Yeah, make money to spend it. Secondly, uh, I call it repay debt. I say repay because you're paying again. You're paying on interest, and it's killing us. The average credit card, for those who have credit cards in, in an average household, something like $8,284. Just credit card. I'm not talking about con, like consumer debt, which is $13.5 trillion, which is mortgages, auto loans, um, credit cards, student loans. Again, we have over $22 trillion. Those, those numbers blow our minds of national debt. So, so a lot of times it's, oh, man, i got to do that. Or sometimes it's this one. It's number three, pay taxes, because you got to do that, right? That's, I mean, against the law if you don't do that. Then number four, maybe save it. Got a little bit left over, save it. And then fifthly, last thing people do, uh, give it, maybe. 
And we'll, depending on tax laws and such, see if it's advantageous for me. So it's not a, it's not a function of the heart. It's, it's a kind of a financial decision at that point. And so we often keep the giving portion to the end. And a lot of people do that to their detriment. And many of you is why your finances are out of whack. Because watch this. Here's the financial flip flop. This is God's better story. It's all of that flipped. First, God says, give it first. Give the first and best to him. It's called a tithe. It's a concept of the tithe. Save it, pay taxes, repay debt. And then finally, spend it. So in that order, you flip it. Now, I realize the debt thing. You need to get rid of the debt. So that could be moved around there. You need, so many of us need to put that forward. But as a church family, you need to know this. We seek to model the role for you. So in a, with, a, with a $13.6 million budget, 1.1% of our budget goes towards debt retirement. Because we are almost debt free. We bought that last house on Villanova. We own all that property there. And so we have, but we have a plan. That's the point. $150,000 a year goes towards debt service. We have a plan to pay that off. And some people are giving directly to that to pay it off. And wouldn't you love, what if you had 1.1% debt in your, that you're paying off? Wouldn't you love that to be your own personal story? We seek, again, because of our leaders in our church. I'm talking about lay leaders, finance committee. I'm talking about Rodney, Brandon Boyd, Corey Thurman, and all who lead us, our deacon leadership leading the way. I mean, with biblical principles, we are seeking to honor God in all that we do. So it's the flip. And so watch this. I want to challenge you with this. For for some of you, you need to come to this Financial Peace University. This is the application for some of you. It'll change your life. Again, starting on September 11th. But before I close, I want to offer this. I want you to develop a planned growth of giving. And here's what I mean. If you're not giving, start giving. If you're not a percentage giver, become one. Be intentional. If you are a percentage giver, then move toward the tithe. Okay? And here's where some people, you've been wondering, what's up with the... With these, uh, 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 these aren't apples, these oranges. What's up with this? Okay, I want you to see this. I've got um, oranges. I've got 10 of them. People say, well, wow, the tithe, uh, that's kind of legalistic, right? Yeah, I mean, that's Old Testament, really. That's the law. No, not the law. It's before the law. But I'll give you that. Okay, Old Testament. That's old school. Uh, It's legalistic. So here's the deal. Okay, give more than the tithe. Um, go beyond the tithe. I know. Hey, listen, I've known a couple of men in my ministry who have has sought their goal was to reverse tithe, live off 10 percent and give away 90 percent. I know a couple of men who literally are doing that. And, and, and it's possible. See, but here's what I want you to see. Ten oranges up here that represent all that God's given us. Now, some of you, here's the deal. Some of you are like, Jeff, I wish I had 10 or I mean, some of y'all are like, I'm hungry. I wish I had 10 orange right now. Um, some of y'all are like, bro, I got a grape. I mean, that's all I got. I've got a grape. Um, so, okay, here's my point. If you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. Watch this. Here's some of you. I got this for you. Some of y'all are like this. I mean, y'all, some of you are like, man, I could bring something to the table. I was going to bring 10 watermelons, but I thought that'd be a little too much. I couldn't get all that in my car, so I just get brought one. But some of you, you're like, you could bring a lot. But how crazy is this? Watch this. Um, let me ask you. God, so the tenth is a, is a tithe. That's a tenth of all that God's given us. All that you have, representing your finances. He says, hey, one. One. Why can we not do this? We, we've gone crazy. And he says, give this first. Now, here's the truth. Everything belongs to him. Everything. So it's not just a function of giving him this. Once you tithe, Stacy and I have been tithing since we got married. I praise God. I married a woman who's generous and says, we've got to do this. But because we give the tithe, we're able to give beyond the tithe. Because tithing does this. It sets your heart on the stuff of God. It, it says, you know what? I'm giving regularly and it, because nothing I have is mine. It's all his. And it reminds me of that every time I give. 
And so as we give the tithe, it impacts the way we spend everything else in our lives. This week, my hope for you is that when Satan comes at you uh, with comparison, with you need this, you're looking on Amazon, I got to get that. I could have that in a couple of hours. I could get, I think it shipped that to me tomorrow. I could get this. For some, it's become an addiction because our hearts are set on the stuff of this world and not on God. And he's saying, everything you spend, friends, listen, this week, every purchase you make, every bit of it belongs to him. And we need to make some decisions in our lives about, about all that God's given to us. And I'm telling you, if you'll follow his principles today that I've laid out, it will change your life. And so here, here's what I want us to do. I, I want to I wanna just close with a challenge. I'm going to ask the band to come on up here because we're going to close out with a song as the last thing we do as we go. But for now, I want to just close it this way. I want to, um, to challenge you this week that that song that we sang earlier, that you just raise a hallelujah, you raise a praise to God when you're tempted by the evil one to compare yourself with others, that you need this, that you need that. When you start getting anxious about your, your finances, if it's because you're in great debt, because you need to get your house in order, you need to act on this. You need to do something. We can help you. And it's what Financial Peace University is all about. It's why we're here to, to encourage you. We have folks in our church that can help you. So you can come and talk to us after the service is over. And as we move into this coming week, we hope that you'll be involved in all that's happening. Young parents, we've got a great teaching moment this Wednesday night. Corey Thurman is going to be doing a thing on tech, having a tech wise family, talking about technology, how you can protect and guide your children. We've got study and courses all across the board. Come join us on Wednesday night for your kids at Kids Collective, all that's happening. But this week, Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do that first. And so when, you're, when Satan comes against you, we need to combat him with the truth of God's word. Lock up your heart. Turn on the lights. Turn on the alarm. And as the alarm goes off, it'll be a diagnostic for you to say, oh, yes, it's not money. It's not the stuff of this world that I'm pursuing. It's God and him alone. I'm going to raise a hallelujah. I'm going to raise a hallelujah to him. Satan, not today, Satan. I'm going to worship the king. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.